I will always tell you the truth, whether you like it or not, whether it's something you want to hear or not, because I want people to know where I stand at all times. When you have such strong relationships, people will go out of their way to help you. Improving every day is a win. One of the youngest builders and developers that we have in the real city industry, with over 10 billions in development, eight projects, 12,000 units. It's Matt Young. Welcome to More Than a Sale. I'm going to get more value in return. They're going to get more value. It's a win-win for everyone. How did you become one of the youngest builders and developers in the city? You're one of the biggest mover and shakers right now with Republic Development. I didn't have any real reason to let me in other than I was hungry and willing to work. What are some of the core principles you're like, this is what someone needs to know in order to get started in this field? Every opportunity is an opportunity to learn. Like success in development is not one big decision generally, it's thousands of little decisions adding on top of one another makes a project successful or not. So everybody was making money, you know? Everyone was making money, but governments especially were making money. They're hurting the people at the bottom end of the totem pole. There's no growth in our economy. If you feel like your career is moving in the right direction, you have momentum, you just wake up feeling good. Who is not young? I can soldier on. I don't really let anything beat me up too much. I was willing to work harder than everybody. That was unquestionable. Just keep your head down, keep doing what you're doing. Getting started, tell me a little bit about your story. How did you become one of the youngest builders and developers in the city? You're one of the biggest mover and shakers right now with Republic Development. You have some crazy projects in the in the lineup and you were silent for a little bit and then bam, you came up with a, with a, with a bang. Yeah, we move fairly quickly once we start a Republic, but my career actually has been a kind of long road to get to this point. Started in 2009, just coming out of the recession. And I actually graduated in 2007 and I was trying to get a job in the industry for a couple of years. And I went back to school in 2008. And then as the market kind of improved towards September, October of 2009, I got given my first opportunity there. And then it's kind of been a long road of just growing and learning and trying to do better and trying to perfect my craft as best I could. I went from you know one company for three years and then I joined another company. I was there for eight years. And then I eventually felt I was ready to start public. So it feels like a long road for me, but I guess on the outside, it looks like it happened pretty quickly. Now you and I were chatting off camera and you were telling me where you kind of got your start from. So why don't you share with our audience and our listeners, like where did you get your first big break from and what sort of kind of got that interest for development? And this, I could see myself doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, I, I spent a summer working for my uncle who had a small little, um, property management company in the beaches area. Mm -hmm. And I was just a laborer for him. I was painting buildings and just doing whatever labor work I could. I realized I really love the tangible aspect of real estate. I love that I could touch it and I could feel it and I could see the impact of improvements on the neighborhood, on tenants, on on uh, people who are experiencing those buildings. But I was always, I always had a creative side to me. I always had an analytical side of my brain and a creative side and I wanted to do something more than that. And then I kind of realized that development, ground up development was a thing. There was a job where you could go and build and design these buildings. So I kind of went down a rabbit hole of trying to learn what the industry was all about. There was no schools at that point in time for development. It was really just, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs and families who were doing it. So I tried to do as much research as I could. I uh, networked as much as I could and tried to get to know different developers and learn about their background. And once I kind of fell in love with the idea of it, I was like, okay, I got to go down this path and just find a way in no matter what. And I didn't have a degree in finance. I did a degree in sociology. I didn't have any real reason to let me in other than I was hungry and willing to work and I appeared a little bit smart. I ended up eventually getting introduced to Mel Pearl at Lifetime Developments. And at the time, I think this was like beginning of 2009 or maybe even 2008. I think I was introduced on an email with him and then we may have had a phone call or two and the market was terrible at the time. So, but he kind of said like, I don't have an opportunity yet, but I might, there might be something coming up. I might have an opportunity um, but there was no promises and no expectation of timelines. So I was finishing off school. I came back in uh, the summer of 2009. I ended up traveling that summer. I actually called him and I said, look, if there's an opportunity here, I'm ready to start work. And there was nothing yet. So I went to travel. I came back in September and immediately I started getting calls, um, not just from Mel, but from others uh, who... I had talked to over the years. Um, and what were these positions that you were applying for? You know, one was uh, one was with Mattamy Homes okay. as like a project coordinator. Okay, so got a, it. A junior role on the development side with them, but it was an opportunity to learn the low rise business. And then it's funny, I was actually leaving an interview with Mattamy and I got a call on the car ride home from, I believe it was Brian Brown at Lifetime saying, hey, would you want to come in for, actually, you know, it wasn't Brian. I think it was Mel's assistant who called me saying, would you like to come in for an interview? So we set up an interview. I think it was later that week. And 
And then I eventually got offered two opportunities pretty much at the same time. And I, I took the, the lifetime opportunity. And what was appealing about the lifetime versus the anatomy? I mean, both big builders and developers. Yeah, I think just my nature is I, I like being um, involved in smaller companies. I like having a bigger impact. And I thought, you know, Madame is a giant organization and an incredible organization, don't get me wrong, but I would have been a cog in the wheel there. Whereas at Lifetime, I think I had an opportunity to prove myself a little bit. There was visibility on what I was doing. And I think they were getting very busy. So I was like, as long as I'm willing to do work and I'm cheap, they're going to give me a ton of opportunity. And, and that's exactly what happened. And on top of that, I loved high, I loved the idea of high rise. I like cities. I like, you know, the urbanity of it. I like the design of uh, the architecture. I like, I feel like they're more, you could be more creative when you're doing high rise. And that to me was more interesting. So, um, so I, it was, it was a obvious, it wasn't even about money either. I, w I would have been offered way more money at Madame, but uh, I, I didn't care about that at all. I would have done it for free. I, I just wanted the learning. In wow. fact, I offered to work for free. Still didn't want me. When you're in a position like that, for our audience and our listeners, what are, what are some of the things that you learned along those way? Like, what is it that you want to learn about the industry? There's so many different factors from a development standpoint. And you and I have chatted about this before. And so there's research that you do. There's, you know, project development. There's a scale. What are some of the core principles you're like, this is what someone needs to know in order to get started in this field? What would you say? I always tell young people, you can get into development in a million different ways. You, if you're a great marketer, there's opportunities on the marketing side. If you're a great finance person, that's a really good place to start learning how to underwrite deals and how to finance deals and things like that. Construction is an area you can get into the business. Customer service is an area you can get into the business. At the end of the day, once you're in the business, it's what you do with it that will affect where your career goes. If you wanna be a developer, you need to know every part of the business. There's nothing you can't understand. And so, and, and if you don't understand it, you better have a partner. If you ever decide to do it on your own, you ever better have a partner who understands that side of the business. Otherwise, at some point in time, you're going to get screwed. When I joined Lifetime, my whole ethos when I got there was I'm going to say yes to everything they offer me. I'm never going to say no to work. Every opportunity is an opportunity to learn. So for me, it was like an education. It wasn't a job for me. It was an education. And I'm going to try and expose myself to everything I possibly can and just make myself as well-rounded and as knowledgeable as possible. And that way I'll be able to add value. At some point I'll be able to add value. If the market went south again and they didn't need me for development, but they needed someone on the marketing side, well, maybe I understood marketing really well and they would keep me on that. Like it was a bit of a job security thing, but also I kind of had entrepreneurial aspirations and felt that one day I would want to do this on my own. And so I should learn every part of the business if I want to do it on my own one day. I like that. Yeah. What are some critical lessons that you learned while working at Lifetime that you've sort of applied now in your own tenure with Republic Developments? Um, I, I learned a ton of lessons there and, and I've probably learned so many lessons there that I've forgotten a lot of them. But, <laughs> you know, I'd say one thing about them was they were incredible executors of projects. Mm. They really focused on, you know, the, the pennies. They really focused on negotiating everything, you know, looking at scopes of work deeply, like just making sure everything was buttoned up as much as humanly possible. Because development is really, like success in development is not one big decision generally, it's thousands of little decisions adding on top of one another makes a project successful or not. So it's really more, the right personality trait is gonna be successful at development, not necessarily someone with one big idea. So they did a lot of the little things really, really well. And so attention to detail was something I learned, you know, negotiating hard, paying attention. You know, there was a saying, uh, you know, watch the nickels and dimes, the dollars will take care of themselves. And so they were very, very focused on that. It was also kind of interesting watching the partners and because there was two partners in that company and they each had very, very different skills. Um, both were incredibly smart and um, added a ton of value, but in different ways. And they worked really, really well as a partnership. The skills that Mel had, Sam, his partner at the time, didn't have. And the skills that Sam had, you know, he was stronger than Mel at. And so it kind of just worked really well together. Um, and so I kind of learned that, you know, in this business, it's it's an amalgamation of a lot of minds to make these projects successful. No one person can make it happen. So Speaking of minds, now you've been in 
all kinds of rooms and you've been with all kinds of individuals and there's different personalities and characters that that you that you meet along the way and i've i've come across these individuals myself and everybody's so unique and different in their own capacity all of them have one big goal and one vision of course to develop great things or sometimes not sometimes it's just hey let's put something together and let's make a shitload of money so yeah. every everybody's vision is sort of sort of driven Taking a combination of all the people that you've come across, what are some of the things that you've implemented uh, for yourself in Republic Developments? And because last time you and I met, we met at uh, we did a we did a interview or a meeting. We did it for Azura Condos, and you were Azura. with uh, uh, Azura. Yeah, and you were with Capital Development uh, at the time, I think. Yep. And so even then, you were, were you know heading that project in a, in a in a very unique way, and I think that that building did really well. If I'm not wrong, yeah, right? exceptionally well, exceptionally yeah, well. So what are some of the, from the things you learned from Lifetime, then the things you learned at Capital, sort of, sort of what's driving Republic now moving forward? How would you say you're leading it? Let me be a little bit more clear with that. Yeah, when, when I started Republic, actually, I spent a lot of time thinking about this exact question. Yeah. What did I want this company to be? And I was really lucky working at Lifetime and at Capital that we did a lot of partnerships and I got to see how a lot of different developers operated. So we worked with Center Court early on at the beginning of their um their career, their business. Uh, you know, we worked with Mancus, we worked with H and R, um, worked with even Charles Caboose at Inc Entertainment when we were doing Bisha, uh, Metropia, Freed, all sorts of different developers, all with different perspectives, all with different talents and skills. And so, what I really tried to focus on was taking the best parts of each of them and trying to build a company that was um, uh, was kind of leveraging, you know, the best aspects of, of all their talents. So when we formed the company, I was starting to put together my kind of vision for what the company should be. And there was three pillars that I kind of landed on that I felt were really, really important. And one of the pillars came from Lifetime. One uh, squarely came from Capital Developments. And one was just something I think I, I innately had. And I always kind of felt I was trying to implement at all those companies and, and with different levels of success, but what are so those the, three pillars? Yeah. So the pillar at, at lifetime was executional excellence. They really focused on executing the projects really well. And you know, every development project is very complicated. They take a long time. There's thousands and thousands of decisions you make, and it's the culmination of all those decisions that makes your success. And so you have to execute really well from beginning to end. There's no breaks. Even when you're six years into the project and you're near the end, but you're not quite there and you're, you have deal fatigue, you still have to kind of continue to, push along and, and make sure you execute well. So that was the thing I learned from them. Super important. The guys at Capital were very different. Um, they cared a lot about execution, but the, mo the thing they cared the most about was relationships. They were such gentlemen, really, really nice guys, and they really built strong relationships with everybody around them. And uh, you, you start to see that when you have such strong relationships, people will go out of their way to help you when times are tough, they're gonna they're gonna come to the table and work with you to find solutions to problems. Whereas if you have kind of mediocre to shitty relationships, nobody wants to help you. You know, they just look at you as a as a paycheck, and you know, when if shit hits the fan, they're gonna move on. They don't care. So I think that was a really valuable lesson: is is how how important really uh, strong relationships are, especially in this business where you rely on so many people for success. And so, you know, when I left Lifetime, like I was, I was kind of taught, you know, I was negotiating a $400 contract for a photographer. I was, they were like, negotiate, you better, <laughs> you better save 50 bucks on that. They cared about every little dollar. And I think sometimes you, you lose sight of the relationship if you do that a little bit too hard. It's a fine line. Um, and so when I joined Capital, I, I started to realize how much more important relationships can be. And so I've tried to really implement that. And whether it's with realtors, you and I have known each other for a while or architects or bankers, you know, anybody, you try to keep the strongest relationships you can and you try to do the right thing, operate with integrity. We care a lot about transparency. I, you know, people have told me and I've been known to be this way. I will always tell you the truth, whether you like it or not, whether it's a, something you want to hear or not. Um, Cause I want people to know where I stand at all times. And I don't like, I like being super direct about everything. So um, I think that's a respectful way to, to honor people and to work with people because you're not beating around the bush about anything. Sometimes that can come across as, as a little sharp or harsh. Um, and so I'm learning to maybe soften that a little bit, but 
Uh, but I think the, the overarching thing of uh, caring about people and having strong relationships, I think that's just so important in this business. And then the third pillar, which was something that I've always really felt strongly about is innovation. And our industry, as you know, is very slow moving and it does not really innovate all that much. And it doesn't innovate for a few reasons. Number one, most of the owners of these companies are older. And so innovation is not in their repertoire. They're thinking the thing I did last year and the year before and the 10 years before that worked. I'm not going to change the, the recipe. If it works, I'm going to keep doing it. And I think that's fine to a certain extent. Our industry is less prone to disruption than a lot of other industries, but it's not, um, it's not completely uh, indisruptible. I mean, there are, there are going to be changes that happen. AI is going to have an impact on our industry. New construction methodology will, methodologies will have an impact on our industry. Environmental regulations, all sorts of things are going to have an impact on how projects get developed, the types of projects that get developed. Um, and so innovation was something that I cared a lot about, making sure that we're on the forefront of that change and that we're helping to drive some of that change and helping to advance the industry forward um, if not for the rest, the rest of the industry for us, because we want to be operationally efficient and we want to be able to do the best job we can. And I want to be able to offer the best value to clients who are buying in our building. So if I can find ways to, you know, improve a process or innovate on product or anything like that, that offers value back to a consumer, I'm going to get more value in return. They're going to get more value. It's a win-win for everyone. So we really focus a lot of, on that. And that kind of formed the three pillars of Republic. I really like that. Touching upon the last part of innovation that you're, ch that you're chatting about, I, just like how you go to a lot of home shows and a lot of videos you see and there's different catalogs, especially when you're bringing and ordering supplies and large materials, especially for construction, I feel like there is innovation there, but not in Canada. If you go to other places, there's better engineered buildings that, for a fraction of the cost, there's better systems in place, plumbing routes to thermal, to how energy and flow of air is, is distributed to construction materials itself. I just find that by the time you get it here, it's really expensive to, to implement with all the sanctions. And of course, this has to do with our terrain as well and our weather mm -hmm. conditions in terms of what we can implement and what we can implement. And, and, and you're a world traveler yourself and you've gotten a chance to explore a lot of areas with great architecture. So it's, I always wonder, I say, why can't we have that great architecture we can implement all of these things, but a lot of builders and developers don't implement them. There must be a reason why. And it has to do with your ultimate bottom line when you're, when you're developing a project. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about that because right now I believe you're lobbying for, for, for certain sanctions uh, against the government for, for things that they've implemented for taxation. So tell, no, talk no, to- not, not sanctions against the government, okay. but um, I'd say to go to the first part of the question, you know, industries in different markets kind of tool up r responding to incentives and responding to uh, regulations and, and basically the rules in place. So Toronto is kind of set up to respond to the rules that have been implemented and construction trades and, and uh, material suppliers, all of these people are kind of implementing the right, the, the products that fit within that or the mechanical systems that fit within that or um, window systems, whatever, that are meeting the price point, meeting the environmental standards, and you know there's an optimal solution. And so you start to see a lot of buildings that look the same because there's such high regulation that every developer is kind of forced to, to uh, there's like a regression to the mean. They're all forced to do almost the same thing. And yeah, there's changes here and there and, and little different sites will have different uh, uh, configurations and ways to do it. But by and large, if you look at a high rise downtown, a lot of them kind of look the same and there's a reason for that. So less regulation in some ways can be really good for design and for architecture. Uh, obviously cost is another component. And so right now our industry is so, everything is so tight. When I started in this business, there was much less sophistication and you could afford to make a mistake or two on a project and still be okay. You know, the margins were a little bit better, um, you know, construction costs were dramatically cheaper, taxes were dramatically cheaper, just everything was cheaper and you could build relatively affordable product. Most people could afford it. It was often cheaper than resale 
Like pre-construction was cheap. There was a point in time, believe it or not, where pre-construction was cheaper than resale. I believe you, yeah. You no, know, and and that's obviously changed over the last fifteen years that I've been in this business. So we are we are working on a lobbying effort. It's not public yet, but our focus is going to be on um, tax reform in housing because taxes, more than anything else, have gotten out of control. When when I started in the business in two thousand nine, taxes represented about twelve percent of the cost of a downtown condo. So. And on top of that, the downtown condo was one third the price it is today. So net net, the taxes were very manageable. Today, it's over 30% and probably upwards to 35% if you count duties and things on, you know, uh, materials and, and things that are baked into construction costs that we don't see. And that to me is staggering. You know, the, the cost of an average condo downtown is upwards of $400 or over $400 a square foot is straight up tax. And if you want to build housing affordably, you can't charge $400 in taxes on homes. It's just impossible. There's no way around it. And so there's got to be a come to Jesus moment here where everyone recognizes this, particularly politicians, because for a long time, it was a cash cow. It, it was it was a really... Um, Everybody was making money, you know? Everyone was making money, but governments especially were making money. And as interest rates continued to drop and it became easier to finance the homes that people were buying, every time that would happen, the government kind of take a little bit more of the pie, you know? Yeah. And and then obviously when interest rates go back up and they, they're taking this much of the pie, the system breaks. And so there needs to be some change around that. And so we're working on something that I think is going to really show politicians and all levels of government from the feds to the province down to the municipality of Toronto that the development industry is ready to work with them and are ready to put their money where their mouth is to make sure that value is passed on to consumers. And that's ultimately what needs to happen is consumers need to be able to uh, buy housing for cheaper. And th this isn't an affordable housing debate. There's a separate conversation about affordable housing and, you know, subsidized housing, things like that. And that is very important. But regular market housing, which is the dominant product, has to become more affordable. There's no way around it. Something has to give. So when you're lobbying, it's not just you lobbying there. I'm sure there's other people involved as well. Yeah. So we're leading this campaign. Um, we've got a government relations group who's supporting us and helping to set up meetings. And, uh, and so we haven't had these meetings yet. It's, it's uh, maybe by the time this podcast comes out, it'll, it'll be public. Um, and then we've got a group of developers who have uh, signed on to this initiative as well. And so we're kind I, of I think, going I think it's much needed. And I, and, I, and I said this once to someone else before as well. I said, I said, everybody has to come together and say, what the F, you know, like relax, you know, you're yeah. hurting the industry as a, as a whole. You're not, gonna, you're not encouraging anyone to go out and develop and build and do more. You're forced to have a certain price point because of all the sanctions. But, but it's not just the industry. Like really who they're hurting are first time home buyers, young Canadians, new Canadians. They're hurting the people at the bottom end of the totem pole. And you really need those people. Like if you want a functioning, healthy society, you need it to be working for everybody. And I totally agree with that. I think the solution for it to be working with everyone that we've been seeing in politics for the last while has been tax more and do these programs and, and people will get benefits from these taxes. But the truth is these programs are generally unproductive. Oftentimes the money doesn't quite make it to the, make it to, you know, the people who should be getting it. And you, you just create a system where the incentive to invest, this incentive to build the incentive to add to our GDP is gone. And you're starting to see that now there's, there's no growth in our economy. And that has to change. There needs to be more growth in the economy. There, we need to go back to a, a market that incentivizes and rewards risk. If you're willing to take the risk, you should be incentivized to do it and you should be rewarded to do it. And if you do that, you can go back to growing the pie because we're not growing the pie right now. And I think if you grow the pie, the, the taxes will solve themselves. But you know, just creating a new program and ballooning government, I don't think that's a, a solution that works. You know, And look, I'm not casting blame on anyone. I think politics is, you know, an interesting beast and um, I'd be a terrible politician, but, you know, I, I, I am an observer of it and you kind of watch the pendulum swing over many years. You know, sometimes it goes a little too far to the right and then it needs to swing back to the left. And sometimes it goes too far to the left and it needs to swing back to the right. And I think yeah. we are absolutely in that moment in Canada today where it's gone way too far left. It needs to dramatically swing back towards the right. And a number of the 
uh, policies and things that have been been implemented or being implemented are going to have to be rolled back and reversed, and we need to set up a, a system that uh, we can rebuild from the ground up. I think that's necessary. I like that. Shifting the conversation a little bit uh, further, who are some influences in your life uh, that have an impact or people that you look up to, people that you learn from, people that you watch and observe that, that kind of mentor you or even guide you? And I'm sure there are days when you're just like, man, I don't know if I'm doing this the right way or if, if this, is, this is the direction I need to be. Who are some of those individuals for you? I've had a, a number of those over my career and you know, they've, some have come in my life and some have left my life. You know, obviously, when I started my career, I think I was really paying attention to everything that um, you know, guys like Brian Brown and Mel and Sam at Lifetime were doing, and they they were great mentors for me. I also had, you know, my mom has been an incredible mentor, uh, super hardworking and and just incredible qualities. My grandfather, her father, was an incredible mentor, very very smart guy. He was an ambassador to for Canada for a number of different countries and taught me a lot of great lessons. Jordan and Todd at, at CD, you know, have been great mentors as well over the years and have taught me a lot of great lessons. And, you know, I've tried to just take those lessons and try and implement them in my day to day life. And, and then, you know, as as I'm building this business now, to be honest, like I don't have partners in the business, so it's just me. And um, and that's something I'm trying to actually build is uh, bring more mentors in you know, create an advisory board, you know, connect with kind of external groups where I can kind of gain some of that because, you know, sometimes being an entrepreneur is lonely and, you know, you, you have problems, you need to bounce them off people and, yeah. and, uh, and you don't always have those people around. So, um, but I've been lucky over the years. I think I've had a lot of great people who've supported my career and a lot of things. Tell me and, and the listeners a little bit about your background. I mean, uh, uh, where'd you go to school? Where'd you grow up? Talk a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah, I, gr I grew up in Scarborough, in the east end of Scarborough, kind okay, of near no the way. Toronto Zoo uh, in Highland Creek. Very middle class background, I'd say. I yeah. mean, like just lived in a regular middle class suburban home and did all the things that a middle class kid would have done then. Like yeah. I was playing a lot of sports and, uh, you know, hanging out with my friends, causing trouble, doing all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, and then I eventually uh, went to university. I went to Western. Okay. I did a degree in sociology, so I did... It has nothing to do with my my uh, industry right now. And what was the game plan when you were doing sociology? Like, where did you... I didn't have a game plan. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I guess my philosophy was just do something very general and like maybe I'll figure it out over yeah. those years. Yeah, there was no plan. It was just get a degree. And, you know, at the time, I'm going to age myself a little bit here, but at the time, the degree you had didn't matter as much. You could kind of just go and get a degree and it showed that you were smart. It showed that you knew how to think. And if you were willing to work hard and um, and put your nose to the grindstone, then you could get opportunities. Today, I think is a little bit different. People are much more specialized earlier on. Um, there's programs for everything, and so I think it feels to me anyway like kind of kids are being fast tracked down to certain paths earlier. Which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I feel very blessed and lucky that I found development because I really love what I do and I, I enjoy it. But um, I had no idea going into university that's what I was going to do. And actually, you know, and, and I kind of joke about this, but sociology on the surface doesn't seem like it would help. But actually, it's a really interesting program because it really teaches you about how societies and systems work. It teaches you about how, you know, whether it's the division of labor or, you know, different political ideologies. And, and you start to understand how people work, how incentives work, how larger systems work, um, which... I think can offer some value in development because you are kind of working in a fairly large system and you've got huge numbers of people who are uh, working on your projects, supporting what you're doing. And so understanding how to, how to motivate them, what their motivations might be, uh, you know, incentive, you know, work product, all, all of that kind of stuff uh, was, we studied in sociology. Uh, so Maybe it added a little bit of value. <laughs> and what are, and, and right now, how are you um, sort of keeping up with your mindset with a current market standpoint? You know, what are you doing to, 
to learn? What are you doing to keep yourself motivated? You know, what, what, are, what, are, what are some of your daily habits and routines that you implement in your life that has helped you to, to lead things forward? Because being, a, uh, you know, being in the position that you're in and running the company that you're running with so many moving parts and, you know, with acquisitions going on, with, with, with architectural plans, the other stuff, and then managing your personal life. So how do you do a little bit of both, kind of break it down? I do spend a lot of time working and I, I am trying to spend a lot more time thinking now. So as problems come up, I try to spend more time kind of thinking about those problems. Uh, How does that look like? Usually it's like I'm on the bike. I, I, I ride my bike a lot. So um, I'll jump on the bike and put headphones in and just kind of think about a problem or I'm in the shower. And I just usually when I have alone time, it's when my brain starts thinking about that stuff. It never really turns off. So um, I'm finding now in this market, especially because the market has really shifted over. And I think we've all seen it over the last 12 months. Um, I'm spending a lot more time thinking about what the future looks like, what, what it's going to take to be successful in a market like this, what it's, you know, when the market's going to come back. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time thinking now, and a little bit less time, you know, doing because I just think that we're kind of at a pivotal moment. And, um, you know, I, I try to do that as much as I can and, and not get myself into <laughs> like a depressing mode where you just feel like nothing's ever going to get better. Cause I, I think it will get better. And, you know, the fundamentals in our market are really strong. Um, you know, so I try not to get too down on myself about where things are at, but, uh, but focus on, you know, what's the right path forward and how to, how to optimize our business and, and make ourselves kind of recession proof. So spending more time doing that. What's next for you? I, I love what we're doing. So I want to continue to do what we're doing and continue to do more projects. I think because of where the industry is right now, businesses are going to have to evolve. And, you know, I was told early on when I started my career, you know, development is very, it's very on or off. The taps are on, the market's hot, things are moving. It's great. But when the market's not there, the taps generally shut off and, and the market kind of dies. And so I'm starting to appreciate that having ongoing cash flow and having a sustainable cash flow business is really important. And so we're really focused on trying to build that out. So we've started an asset management business, for example. We're, we're managing four assets right now on behalf of family office clients where you know we're implementing a lot of the skills that we have in development. A lot of that entrepreneurial nature, you know, problem solving nature and trying to apply it to, you know, owning and managing and adding value to assets. So, um, so we're doing that with some success. We want to grow it and continue to grow that side of the business. Um, but that's one area that I think is probably on the horizon for us. We're building software right now. Um, again, this kind of falls on the innovation category, but software that supports what we do in our business will make us more efficient, will allow us to create a lot of value um, through a lot more value through the process and uh, ultimately offer a better experience for buyers, a better experience for brokers um, who work with us. So uh, that's kind of a, call it a side project that we're working it's happening on in the background. Bit. Yeah. Happening in the background. Yeah. You know, and then I'm, I'm starting to think about the future of development and where, where the world's going. And, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about this one, but I, I'm, I tend to think that there's going to be more purpose-built rental product built in the future. I think right now, just with affordability, there's going to be less less people able to afford to buy homes, and there's going to be more people who are renters. And so uh, finding a way to build that product but do it in an innovative way that's not just copying and pasting what other really successful rental operators are doing. Yeah. So we're working on a business model there and I think it's going to take more time for that to evolve and kind of flush itself out. But that could be kind of a long, that's probably a five to 10 year plan. What are some of the, the hurdles that you face when it comes to the field of work or what are some struggles that you have? Uh, you know, what would you say is the biggest, you know, lowest point in your, in your career or in your life? Two different questions, career and life, very, very different low points, but, um, I find it always, coin <laughs> I always find it coincides, you know, something happens in the life, it affects the career a little bit. Yeah. Unless someone uses the career as a, you know, to kind of offset the life part. Yeah. Or an early low point was actually when I graduated university in 2007, I was like full of piss and vinegar, ready to go. And, you know, basically the biggest recession, uh, since the great depression happened. So, there was no opportunities, no jobs, no nothing. And like for two years, I was pretty much stalled. That became very depressing because I was, I just felt like I'd done everything right. I'd gone to school, I got my education, 
and just timing sucked. And, um, and a number of my friends were in the same boat. So that was just a depressing time in my life. You know, in my career, to be honest, I love the business. So I haven't had too many depressing moments. And, and I, I think we've been really lucky over the last four years, we've built up an enormous pipeline. We've got incredibly exciting projects, um, all projects I'm very proud of. Obviously right now, again, it's, it's bad luck. It's nothing I can control, but the market is terrible and things are very slow. So, you know, it definitely, you know, it's not as fun waking up every day knowing that it's just going to be a grind and that like you're, you're, you're doing triple the work or double the work with, for half or less than half the outcome. And it just feels like you're kind of walking through mud. Um, but it's, you know, there's been moments in my career that have been like that as well. Um, 20 back half of 2012 to, you know, 2014, especially 2013, I launched the project 155 red path and it sold very slowly and it's just a slow time in the market. Nothing you can do, you know, you just have to keep pushing along. So, you know, we're doing that now and trying to stay optimistic, but it definitely makes it a little bit harder when you're not seeing that momentum. And I think that applies to any industry, any career. If you feel like your career is moving in the right direction and you have momentum, you just wake up feeling good. And if you don't have that momentum and you feel like you're stuck, even if you're just working for a company and you're just stuck in that same role and you can't quite get to the next level and it just feels like it's dragging on, you just start to feel a little bit disenfranchised and, um, you know, maybe a little bit depressed about it and it, uh, it slows you down. I think, you know, some people rise to the occasion and they kind of soldier on. I've been really, I think, lucky in my life that I've been kind of, my personality is one that is, you know, I can soldier on, you know, I, I don't really let anything beat me up too much. And I'm pretty good at just putting my head down, focusing on the work and kind of ignoring the rest of the noise. But I know others deal with it in much more difficult ways. And, uh, and so that stress and that those challenges kind of really weigh on them and it almost uh, paralyzes them from moving forward. So what would you say you know, drives you? I think it's just competition. Yeah. It's purely, com it's in fact, it's purely competition. Yeah. I don't give a shit about the money to be honest. Um, my lifestyle hasn't changed one bit since I started my business, but I love competition. Like I thrive on it. I had a twin brother growing up okay, and he and I fought over everything. We competed over absolutely everything. I think it became ingrained in my nature that I was just a competitor and I was going to fight to win at everything. And it yeah. didn't matter what it was. It was, it was grades at school. It was who gets the last steak on the dinner table. You know, who, who talks to that girl, Wh whatever the issue was, uh, we would compete over it. And we actually both became successful in, in our own careers. I think partly because of each other, because we competed with each other so hard that you get out in the real world and you're like, fuck, this is a cakewalk. Like, <laughs> and I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm yeah. just saying, you know, I went through 18 years of straight up competition every single day. There was no rest. There was always a fight for something. And now it, it's just second nature. Like I can do this all day. I can do it in my sleep. So um, yeah, I, think, I think competition is kind of the thing that keeps me going. And when you ride bikes, and of course, that also is a competition on its own when you're racing. And you've been in races before too, right? Yeah. Tell me, what, what do you, what's, what's your mind going through at that point in time? What are you fixated on? You know, that edge and that rush of just, you know, riding your bike and surpassing one winning. bike right at a time. Yeah, winning. I want to win. You know, I want to, and sometimes it's not winning against other people. I've, I ride with people who are way faster than me. You know, we, we, like we co-founded a cycling team and we've got a women's team and we had a pro team last year. You know, one of our riders is now riding in Europe, like, I'm not faster than him, but I have a competition with myself. And so getting better and getting stronger and just getting better at things, I think, um, you know, that's always been a big driver for me. So the, the idea of continuous improvement, constantly getting better, constantly making yourself a little bit better every single day. I think that's something that's driven me and competing with others is fun. And I like doing that too. And it's, it could be in anything. We'll, I'll compete. We'll play poker, you know, <laughs> lifting weights, riding bikes, development, it doesn't matter what it is. Racing cars, I don't care. I'll compete over anything. I just find it fun, to be honest. What does winning look like? That's a very, that could be a, either a super simple question or that yeah. could be like a really profound question. What does winning question. look like to you, you know? I just think improving every day. Yeah. I think like for me, improving every day is a, is a win. Got it. Right? Yeah. I like that. I, you know, I'm not, I've never been, in my opinion, I've never been the best at anything. I've always been pretty good at a lot of things. You know, I wasn't the tallest guy or the biggest guy or whatever. So in sports, but I was willing to work harder than everybody. That was unquestionable. So I would end up being pretty good at a lot of things just because I was willing to work hard. When the other guy was like huffing and puffing, and getting tired, I was willing to push through. I remember 
in high school, we used to have to do this thing. Do you ever do a beep test in high school? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we basically run across the gym and there's this beeping thing. I think it was, I think it was a, a football coach or somebody invented, I forget, but they used to have to make every grade do it. One, I think it was once a year. But yeah, it was a big, it was a challenge of your fitness to see how, how, yeah. Yeah. So, and I was not the athlete in high school. Like I was like, you know, five foot nothing and, you know, weighed like 120 pounds. Like I, I didn't really like, you know, uh, grow until I was probably in like grade 12 or something. Yeah. And I had asthma. So like, I was doing this thing and it was just that I was unwilling to give up and I was willing to just fight harder. And I, I was really good at like suppressing the pain. I just, I noticed that from a young age, I was really good at suppressing the pain at things. You know, I, I remember like we were near the end of the beep test and like everybody had fallen off, like, I don't know, a minute or two earlier, like everybody was long gone. And like a friend of mine on the side who they were all cheering me on, he's like bringing out my asthma inhaler. I'm doing the asthma <laughs> inhaler as I'm running this thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's just a funny story, but um, I think that's just been my nature since I've been young. What's a favorite quote of yours or, or something that inspires you since you're a competitive individual? Favorite quote? Oh, you're putting me on the spot here. Uh, you know, David Goggins? I've, of course. Yeah. So I, I love David Goggins. I think yeah. the guy's a total psychopath, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I love his mentality on life. And he's got a saying, he's like, suppress your inner bitch. And I, I just love that. I think it's I hilarious like and funny. But if you really read into it, what he's saying is like pain and suffering and all these things are in your mind. And if you have a really strong mind, you can, you can park that stuff for a while and you can soldier on. And like the really strong people, the successful people, the people who end up living great lives are the ones who I think are able to manage that stress really well and persevere. That's amazing. Look, man, I, I really, uh, truly enjoyed our conversation today. And uh, I got a chance to learn about you. I think our, our audience and our listeners got a chance to learn a little bit more about you. You know, that you're a competitive individual, but not only that, you're very passionate about what you do and, and, and the difference that you want to make in the, in the industry and in the community and to all the developments that you, that you put together. I want to finish off this podcast and the show with one important question. Who is... Matt Young. Very profound questions coming out of you today. This is, uh, <laughs> who is Matt Young? He's a passionate um, person who really enjoys his life and wants to, wants to leave the city and the world a little bit better than, you know, he came into it. And uh, I'm trying to do that in my little way with development. I like that. And so knowing what you know now, if you had to do it all over again, what would you tell your younger self? You know what? I don't, I don't think I'd change much, honestly. I don't think I'd tell myself anything other than just keep your head down and, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I, I honestly feel blessed that things have generally worked out in my life and in my career. Maybe, actually, you know what? I tell myself one thing. Enjoy the wins when they happen. For a long time, I kind of never did that. I just, you get a win and you immediately move on to the next goal. And so I'm really trying to do that a lot more now. Just enjoy the little wins when you can. Because, you know, they don't always come along. And when they do come along, I think it's important to, to embrace them and uh, just have a moment to reflect. I like that. I really do. That, that speaks to me because I, I feel the way, same way sometimes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in for a special episode with Matt Young. Uh, this, was a, this was an incredible one because I got a chance to learn more about him. And I'm sure you did as well. Stay tuned for the next show.